Hey, Amy. Yeah, Juan. Give me that beat. It's Baseball Shangri-La with Amy Cuevas and Juan Ramirez. What's up, party people? She is Amy Cuevas. I am Juan Ramirez. You are listening or watching Baseball Shangri-La. If you are listening on the audio portion, please make sure you are subscribed to the podcast. Rate us, write us a review. Make sure you're subscribed. Uh, help spread the word. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed to our YouTube channel. Hit that notification button. Give us a thumbs up. Uh, leave us comments. We love engaging with you guys. And make sure you're following us on social media on X at BB Shangri LA, on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitch at Baseball Shangri LA. Amy, ¿cómo estás? I'm trying not to melt in my apartment. You can see my fan is blowing the background. So if I melt into the ether, that's why. Save me. Wait, what's happening with the air conditioning? Oh, it's on. It's just hot. It, it's still really <laughs> hot. All right. Yeah. <laughs> and we're recording later in the night and it's still hot so i'm my, my my apologies to you amy how was your weekend it was good it was mellow we have a lot to talk about baseball wise we do uh and i just want to give a shout out to one of our listeners uh I was not uh one of our listeners uh heather who sent me a message this weekend i I was not aware that we have a reputation of not just being a baseball podcast, but people seem to really enjoy our love of B movies, uh, Amy. So Heather had a question for us, and I'm throwing it out there. Amy, have you ever seen the major motion picture Runaway starring Tom Selleck, Gene Simmons, and Kirstie Alley? I don't think I have. Oh, but rest in peace, Gene. No, no, not Gene Simmons. Sorry, wrong Simmons, Richard. Wow, Simmons. You, sorry, yes, Richard Simmons. We, we saw we lost Richard Simmons this past week. Yes. And not only that, but the great Shelley Duvall. Uh, for those of you, um, Fairy favorite, Tale Theater. <laughs> I, I know a lot of people loved Fairy Tale Theater when that's how they associate Shelley Duvall. To me, uh, a lot of people, she was olive oil in, in Robert Altman's Popeye movie. Oh, uh, see, and my best friend's like, ooh, The Shining, so. <laughs> and there's, the, of course, The Shining. I mean, she's that's probably, I think, what she is best known for. Uh, and it's just for anybody who knows the making of that movie. Apparently, Stanley Kubrick just tortured her, and it mm. really shows up in that performance. But I feel like she, not only the fairy tale theater, but I think she was very underappreciated as an actress, uh, so yeah, people think of uh, the shining people think of her as olive oil from Popeye. I do think she did her best work under Robert Altman. So if you guys are any Robert Altman fans or Shelley Duvall fans, my recommendation is watching Robert Altman's three women, which is a very, uh, little scene film. Uh, but she's in a lot of Robert Altman movies. So if anybody wants to have a Shelley Duvall retrospective, you're probably going to end up watching a lot of Robert Altman movies. Uh, and then we lost Shannon Doherty. So anybody who is a 90210 fan, it, it was a rough weekend yeah. uh, th this past weekend. I'm, I'm assuming that had nothing to do with Heather's question about the, the runaway. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. We got, uh, we got sidetracked, but Heather, yes, I have seen the major motion picture runaway. Uh, the best way I can describe it, and this is when I was a kid and I had HBO for free and I would literally watch every movie. So Runaway is Tom Selleck plays this futuristic cop and Gene Simmons makes these electronic spiders that just go out there and kill people. And it, it's technology. And uh, like I said, it does. Uh, it, it's uh, it was one of those movies that I saw on HBO. So, yes, Heather, I did see Runaway. I don't agree with you in the sense that it is the greatest movie ever. Uh, we'll just agree to disagree on that, Heather. But at least one of us here in our appreciation of B-movies has seen Runaway. So that being said, I've delayed as long as possible because I know we probably don't want to go into what happened to the Dodgers this past weekend. Oh, I have and, all kinds of positive topics. So I'm good. All right, good. All right, so... Not just this past weekend, but this whole week, it was a rough road trip for the Doyers. The Doyers went one and five in their road trip against mm. uh, the Phillies of Philadelphia and the Tigres of Detroit. 
So, Amy, because you are the princess of positivity, give me the positives before we have to deal with the good, the bad, and the doyers. I mean, I keep, or I don't even know where to start. I'm like looking at all my notes and they're all just jumping out at me at once. Um, Otani hit not only his 29th home run of the season, but he hit his 200th career home run. So kudos to him in that game on Saturday against, uh, gosh, who are we playing at that point? The Tigers? The, the Tigers, yes. Um, in the Phillies series, we got to see Kike pitch. So he pitched one and a third innings. He went into the seventh and the eighth. Uh, he has a zero ERA this season, and he brought down his career ERA from 81 to 16.20. That, that, that's big. That That is very big. Which begs the question, should there be some kind of mercy rule in in the league? Um, that, let's get into that. Would you? I've actually, that was kind of a thesis of mine for a minute was I, I think there should be some kind of agreed upon rule when it's really a blowout. One to not only save bullpen staff, but also to save position players who I think have the potential to be injured on the mound. And like, that's the last thing you need is somebody throwing, doing something that they're not used to. Maybe they're not used to being up on the mound and then something happens. And now that player's out because what they were already losing a game anyway. I, I feel like there should be some agreed upon mercy type of rule to, to just save players from injury because there's so much already that can go wrong in a, in a season. What about you? Where do you? How, how, how would you do it? Would you do it like the standard, like, I know with, with my daughter in, in her league, it's if they're trailing 10 after five, you know, it, it's over. Would you do the same thing? Is that how you would do it? I don't know. Cause like, I feel like in some cases, like we saw that one game where we came back, you, we had a grand slam, you hit a three run home run. We came back like for seven runs. So I almost feel like potentially it should be the team that's trailing. Like, I don't think that they should be able to give up right away. Like fourth or fifth inning to be like, all right, we're done. But like, if we're getting into like the seventh and eighth inning, I feel like, if the the losing team is like, dude, let's just call it. I feel like maybe some of the onus should be on them versus like trying to throw a number on there because, you know, for two teams playing, you know, in this specific game, maybe they can come back from an eight run deficit versus, you know, these two teams, there's no way that that's going to happen. And we really want to save our arms. So I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting I, because I am not a fan of seeing position players pitch. So if, if you're going to do that to me, you've already given up. So I, but mm -hmm. I don't know how that's going to fly with players because right. they don't want to ever seem like they've quit, right? You never want to see your team throw in the white flag. So if you leave it to a team to sit there and go, all right, we've run out of pitchers. That's it. Because that in a sense is kind of what happened on Sunday to the Doyers against the think it is because everybody we're going to get into it. Everybody was crucifying Roberts as to oh why he didn't bring in Vesia to pitch in that bottom of the ninth. But he Roberts had said that Vesia was the last man standing. And if you go into that extra innings, it was going to be a position player out there pitching. So, I, and at this point, I think we've we've literally burned the bullpen. We've Brandon Morrowed them yeah. all at this point. Yeah. The fact that who was it Phillips that had um, back tightness? I at this point, I can't even keep up with where everybody. No, was. it was Dan it was Daniel Hudson. Daniel that, Hudson. That's, that's, and that's why, why we didn't. We see didn't Daniel. And yeah. that's why we didn't use him. Like, I'm just looking over my notes the most uh, starting pitcher went was five innings. And that was Robleski on Saturday. We had four innings from Miller on Tuesday, 4.2, four and two thirds from stone. You had the combined Banda and knack like opener kind of piggyback. They went five and a third combined. Um, you've got three, three and two thirds from Paxton. We already talked about Robleski. And then you've got Brent Honeywell making his Dodgers debut and he went three and got pulled. I don't know if that's because he's only played in two games so far this season for the Pirates, and so we wanted to be judicious with his arm. Could he have gone another inning? I don't know what the reasoning behind that was, but the whole story behind that is the bullpen had to pick up all of that slack. And <sighs> No, I, I think the reasoning, the reasoning on Honeywell was he had pitched earlier in the week, I believe. I believe ah, he threw okay. 40 pitches. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe – that was the reasoning as to why they they did. I mean, I don't I mean, Roberts after the game, it said he didn't even expect them to get three 
uh, out of Honeywell. I mean, I was reminded about that game when the Gigantes threw a bullpen game against the Dodgers and Bevins went five. You right. know, <laughs> we're, you we know, were like, so. hey, isn't that the reliever who just. <laughs> I, exactly. I, it would have been great if Honeywell could have done that. But going back to your question about the mercy rule, I'm not against it because, like I said, I am just, I don't want to see position players out there. But I think there's a reason why we've never seen a mercy rule in Major League Baseball is because we shouldn't be. You know, this is supposed to be competitive baseball. This is supposed to be the best players in the world. We shouldn't be, you know, they shouldn't be getting their ass kicked by 10 runs after five innings. So, And that's the slippery slope, right? Because we've already right. got teams that don't pour, you know, owners that don't pour into the team who like eh, play, but kind of don't play. And then now you add a mercy rule and it's like, uh -huh, I'm going to get set up for the draft next year. Yeah, I, I'm not like like I said, I'm not against it. I just don't know how you enforce it because there's been plenty of examples. And we saw one this weekend where the Deaconess were trailing by five runs and they came back and won that game, in, mm -hmm. you know, in the ninth. And then later on, an extra because inning. Because that so, literally is baseball. Mm. Yeah. So I just don't know how you I don't know how you enforce it. I don't know if you do 10 after five. I don't know if you do it. Only when the other team has run out of pitchers and that and I don't know if, like I said, if the players will be on board. I think it's a really good question that you you bring up, Amy. I just I don't know how to answer it because there is a part of me that feels if teams have to, you know, get if they get mercy ruled. You're going to deal with the shame. You're going to get, I mean, mm -hmm. the timeline was already broken this weekend. You know, whatever the Dodgers did this week, they broke their fans this week. So could you imagine uh, if on top of that, you added the Dodgers mer got mercy, literally got mercy in a game this, this year? I was watching, like just watching things play out on social media. And I felt like, um, I'm going to harken back to one of my, my favorite scenes in the Hook movie where they're in the clock shop and Hook is going crazy because he's hearing ticking and you see Jack with like a pocket watch or a clock or whatever. And he's like, oh my God. That's how I felt this week watching social media where it's like, do you guys even enjoy watching? Like nobody likes losing, but it just feels like the intense emotions out there. This is, in my opinion, and again, my opinion this is a game we're supposed to enjoy we're not going to win every game so to see people just the vitriol even for your own team that's out there i do not understand it because while i was not happy that the games went the way that they did being one for five it doesn't feel good but like in the grand scheme of things we're still seven games up like could that change at any point sure but like i do you enjoy, I guess my question out there would be like, do you enjoy watching baseball? Do you enjoy following this team? Because some of the stuff people put out there, it just doesn't feel like they do. You know, I know we're going to get into it in our next episode that we're going to go back and, and look at the first half of the season. So I, I'm going to save that, my response to that question in, in, we'll in the a, next episode. We'll put a pin in it. We're going to put a pin in it, but you know, the Dodgers got a test earlier in the week facing the Phillies of Philadelphia. You know, this was the team that had the best record in the National League. Uh, and this is how you could measure yourself to see how it is because there is a strong luck. I would I would say we can't, we can't measure when, when most of the team is out on the IL right now. Like, it is a well, measurement, yes, but, like, against, like... But and and here's the thing, I I totally see what you're saying. You have to take into account uh, all the players that the Dodgers are missing because for the most part, the Phillies got their the Bryce Harper came back, Schwarber came back for this series. We saw the Phillies' best pitchers. Yeah, we didn't see Ranger Suarez, but the guy who pitched for the Phillies in the first game, he's lights out at, mm -hmm. at that at that stadium. So, but we saw Wheeler and we saw Aaron Nola. And so for the most part, we saw the Phillies top pitchers. Mm -hmm. Now, when they play again in L.A., it's guaranteed. I mean, you hope that the Phillies are going to see a different Dodger team. You mm -hmm. hope that by then some of these guys who are injured are going to be coming back. But I don't want to use that as an excuse, Amy, because, OK, the first game they just got they got their asses kicked. I mean, there's nothing 
there's nothing you can do there. I mean, they got their asses kicked, but that's Miller, Miller, Miller got optioned after that game. He gave up nine runs in, yeah. in just in four innings, which can't feel good. I feel bad for the guy. And then to get optioned right afterwards, like I hope he gets the reset that he needs before he comes back up. Yeah, they, they made him wear it. Uh, mm-hmm. They made him wear it. Now, in the second game, that was a one-run game. Mm-hmm. And I go back to, unfortunately, it's something, a conversation we've had all in the first half of the season in terms of runners in scoring position. But when you have first and third and one out, and the next two hitters are Shohei Otani or T- and Teoscar Hernandez, those are the guys you want up for the Dodgers. And for the Dodgers to not score, that's a blow. That's a blow. And that's why I get the injuries. I get all of that. But in that situation, you had your best RBI guys and they, and they didn't come through. So they end up winning that game. Maybe the series doesn't look as bad. And this is why I'm saying it's a test. It's a Mm -hmm. test because even though we don't have our big horses, we can still compete with this team. And I think psychologically that does something for the Dodgers. I think you could say the same thing for the last game in the series. Yeah, five to one, it looks like the Phillies came out there and done. But again, the Dodgers had opportunities. They had runners in scoring position, and the Dodgers couldn't do it. And this is something that you have brought up in, and I think in last week's episode, the bottom of the lineup was actually doing their job. It was the top of the lineup that wasn't coming through. And that is one thing that I'm keeping my eye on for the second half of the season, because I think the reason why Dodger fans got broke this week was not only because they got swept by the best team in the national league. And let's make no mistake right now, as of right now at the all-star break, the Phillies are the most complete team in the national league. I, 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 they had one through nine making contributions in that series. Uh, the Dodgers they, also, still- they also played small ball. Yeah. They exactly. were also moving the next guy over. I will say I did get to see two rundowns this weekend, which I, or the last week, which I texted you about both. Cause I was very excited. Um, and we also found out during that, that second Phillies game on the ESPN uh, in game interview, which, you know, I love so much. Uh, that's when they Oscar announced that he was going to be part of the home run derby. Um, so random yes, stuff bit, in the midst of that. And we're going to talk about that later, but just. Yeah. Put a pin in that. that. We're going to, we're going to talk to about the Oscar and the home run derby. Uh, I do want to talk to you about Dave Roberts, um, especially in that Philadelphia series. Amy, you're in that you cover the team. You've been in there many times with Dave Roberts. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the first time probably since the playoffs I, I, I can't remember seeing him like this in the regular season. Uh, he really looked to me like he was defeated. I know a lot of people were making, pointing out his body language, but in those post-game interviews, like he really looked dejected. And when they asked him questions and he responded with, I don't know, like they literally, well, hey, why doesn't the team hit with earners in scoring position? And Roberts literally says, I don't know. This is what I have to put out there. These guys are the coaches. These guys have all the information. These guys have more information than we do. If they don't know what's wrong with the team, how the hell do we know what's wrong with the team? Are you entitled? I mean, I feel like there's this level of entitlement that like we, we should know everything that they know. And like, it almost feels like fans know too much about baseball to where again it's getting in the mid it's it's ruining their enjoyment of the game where like i look at it like he just went through a bunch of rough games he's got media asking him questions he probably like they can look at their stats all they want we can look at all the stats from the postseason last year we still don't know why mookie and freddie weren't hitting or the rest of the team wasn't hitting other than it's a smaller sample size they have a break you know between games but beyond that what do you do because those players are still trying. Same thing with right now. These guys are tired. They're they're limping along. <laughs> they're missing key elements of their roster, not only on, on the defensive side, but also on the pitching side. What is he going to say? 
anything he says is still going to get ripped apart anyway. So like, I mean, to me, it's totally understandable. He's, he's between a rock and a hard place with media and, and they're doing all that they can. Those players are still going out every night, even with all those losses, they were still going out and trying. Is it the results everybody wanted? No, but I, I go back to what Mookie said during, I think it was the second broadcast he was on with, with Oral Hershiser and Joe Davis. Baseball is hard. It's hard to hit that ball. And with the way that the game has trended over the last few years, it's gotten even harder. These guys are professionals. We expect a lot out of them. I think one of the quotes Dave Roberts even had this weekend was they're expected to play perfect baseball. These are humans. They're not all going to click at the same time. They're not all going to gel. They're trying, but that's just not happening right now. And because we've been bitten by the injury bug once again, stuff's going to happen. So I guess I just, I, I would turn the question back. Like, what do you expect him to say? Like, what, what do you want him to say? I, I'm not, I'm not critical of, of what he said. I really appreciate his candor. He's being honest. And I just mm-hmm. feel the fans need to be honest with themselves. He's being honest. And he is telling you when he is telling you back to the quote that you said, where the Dodgers have to play perfect baseball. He is acknowledging that their margin in it for error is very, very minimal. And that's now, not realistic for anybody. I know I'm not perfect in my life. Like, t- I don't know about you. Maybe you, I mean, actually, we've already established you're perfect. But, like, that's out- right. outside of that, like, we're, <laughs> I just, I don't know. I, I guess my question goes out to the to the general whoever's is this fun for you watching it this way? Like, it doesn't look like people are having fun. No. And I, I, I think again, the Dodgers had a very rough, rough week and I'm not just talking about the losses. I think this week, the organization has looked, it, it has looked a bit disarray because it just seems now it, it looks like they're at a loss. Like they themselves, I don't think anticipated this is going to happen to them. I don't think they expected everything. I mean, it's Murphy's law. Everything that can go wrong has gone wrong for them in this stretch. Plus the expectations that everybody has thrown on them that they have to play up against. Like that's, that's a like, I feel like, yes, these guys are professionals. They get paid a lot of money to do what they do, but also like we all talk about like how, how fortunate for them. They get to play a little kid's game as their job. Well, how enjoyable is it right now? Like, how enjoyable are we as fans making it for them? Like, yes, we want them to put a good product out on the field. But I I guess I just always come back to, like, do we think they're not trying their best? Like, yeah, we're more spoiled than others with the way they win. I I mean, look, if anybody is being honest and fair, I don't think anybody blames them for, for the injuries. What I feel like was made it a really rough week for them is it does feel like there is not everybody's on the same page. Mm-hmm. You mentioned Bobby Miller being sent down to the minors. It, they said he's going to be down in the minors for a while. Glass now is now on the aisle as well. Yeah. But for the Bobby Miller thing to be down in the minors for a while and Hey, you know, give him the time, let him try to fix whatever he's saying. But it seems like Bobby Miller didn't know that was the plan. And that's what that's what I think is a bad look. I think what also is a bad look is when Walker Bueller and I've talked to other people uh, and asked them, hey, is it common for someone to train outside of the facility? You know, not use the Dodgers training staff. And they said, Juan, it's not uncommon. You know, you can go ahead and do it. It's uncommon for the Dodgers. Because the Dodgers yeah. don't operate that way. Well, it'll be uncommon until it isn't. I mean. Yeah. And so, when, again, you have Dave Roberts asking, answering questions in a pregame saying, I can't give you information on Walker Bueller because we don't know. So, again, it's a stretch. Which that- is funny because you sent me you sent me somebody's tweet on that. And then I also saw, I think it was Fabian Ardaez and like I, I read both of them and I did not take it the same way that you did. Like I looked at it and I was like, all right, he doesn't know. Walker's doing his own thing. They'll figure it out when they figure it out. And like, I, that's, I, 
it's not you're right, I'm wrong, I'm right, you're wrong. It's just I think sometimes that's how we see things differently when we're when we're looking at stuff. And to me, I looked at a number of tweets that mentioned the whole Walker Bueller thing and it didn't strike me as off in any way. And I was just like, all right, cool. Well, he's out rehabbing and they don't know yet. They're going to get a, a progress report at some point. They're not going to just be in the dark. And so I was like, all right, on to the next thing, because we've got so many things going on with this team. Um, I, I, and I get it I, I, because you're right. Going back, they don't owe us. They don't need to give us any of this information. But when they don't give us any of this information, what it does allow is for narratives to be put out there. There is but perception. They, they, but they did put it out there. Like I saw a bunch of the beat writers all tweet the same thing. So like it was said in a press conference. And as you and I know, sometimes they'll put up on like Sportsnet, maybe like two or three, maybe four minutes of like Doc's press or the players. As we're in there, sometimes those go for six minutes. Sometimes Doc's can go for 10 minutes. So there's also information that's being relayed out there that just isn't going to make it into a snackable chunk that the public at large is going to be able like I don't know if they're not putting it up there because they don't think people will watch that long of a clip or they're just you know what the beat writers or whoever else is there is going to cover it so it'll get out eventually but to me when I saw that it was like enough people covered it it probably came from the scrum and they're just relaying that information so I didn't like that's where when it's like he says he doesn't know I agree with you I appreciate his candor but it's like all right he doesn't know they they're not going to let Walker Bueller go rogue. So he may not know at this point, but he's also said that about other players. He didn't know at one point what Gratterall was doing. He didn't know what Brazier was doing. He was going to get with the trainers and find out. Right. And I, I guess that for me, the difference that I've noticed is that those, all those other people that you mentioned, Gratterall and Brazier are working with the organization. Bobby Miller is being sent down in the minors to work specifically with Dodger coaches in particular, Rob Hill. He is working specifically. So for me, for Walker Bueller, from what I've read and from what other beat writers have reported, it is this is Walker Bueller's decision. And he has every right to mm -hmm. go ahead and work with his own trainers because it's his career. And we don't we can't lose sight of the fact that this is his free agent year. Right mm -hmm. now, again. For him to do that, my question is, why isn't he working with the Dodgers coaches? Is it that he just doesn't trust the Dodgers coaches? Is it what the Dodgers coaches were You're giving so him? You're so cynical. <laughs> I, it, I, I, or, I, it's or, not that I'm cynical. I just, I really feel like this is out of the ordinary for this organization. Because but does it have to come down to like trust? Can it just be, hey, you know what? I, I really like the way these guys are doing this. I really like the new, whatever the approach is. I want to try this. I'm clearly in my head. I'm not where I want to be. I need to get my confidence level up. I think this is the best solution for me. If this doesn't work, we try it your way. To me, like, I don't think it means that he doesn't trust the trainers. He's just doing what's best for him and what's best to get his head right. And, and if the team is like signing off on that, then, Hey, you have our blessing. Go, go do what you need to, to come back and be healthy. I, and, and you're right. That is speculation on my part. Uh, because, and the reason why I say trust is because this is a pitcher who had uh, a second Tommy John and it took a while for him to get that second injury. So I, I say trust because I would have to wonder if I'm a pitcher and I got injured, was I diagnosed by the trainers wrong the first time, and now I have to get I have to get surgery, you know? See, and I and I look at it like he got one of the newer revisionist surgeries. I believe he's one of that's that's only been done I think in the last like year or so. So maybe because of that, they have different training methods that we haven't seen yet. Because again, this is a newer surgery versus what they were doing before you have the braided piece that's in there and, and whatnot. So who knows, maybe they, the training in most places hasn't caught up to the newer technology of the surgeries and these people have a better grasp on it. I, to me, because it is, it is all speculation. Like I just tend to go into for me, if this is what he thinks be is best for him and the team is on board. All right, done and done, you know, all right, what's the next game? Are we going to win it? Are we going to lose it? Okay, once that's over, we've got a new game the next day. And so I guess I I think that's where we're a little different. And I just, I'm, maybe I just don't dig in that much. Uh, I, I bring it up because I, I just want to say this and then we'll move on to the next topic. I would not be surprised if at the end of the season, 
something comes out in terms of how all of this was being dealt with. Uh, I don't think we're going to, we're going to hear it during the season, but I would not be surprised. I just feel that this year in particular, going back to spring training to the decision of moving Gavin Lux, and I, it just feels, and I could be wrong, but watching this team and covering this team, there seems to be the communication seems off and that is just something I'm not used to seeing with this team. I mean, one of the things that Dave Roberts, I think, is really well known for and respected for, and I think most people consider his strength, is that he's able to get all these guys to pull in the same direction, get all these guys to buy in to how they're going to be used. And it just seems that this year that cohesiveness is off but I may, like you said, I may be reading too much into it. I may be reading in between the lines a little too much. But that kind of stuff all happening in one week, I think, was was really, you lose games. Like, there's no shame in getting beat by the Phillies. And then as we go into the Tigers series, they very easily could have swept that series. You know, it took them having two meltdowns in order for the Tigers to come back. And those meltdowns were as a result of what you just said, you had a bullpen that is running on fumes. Starting starting pitching and the bullpen. And I think this goes into, and maybe this is why for me, it's it's so easy to write off. I, I think it goes for me beyond when people are like, oh, baseball, it's just, you know, you hit the bat against the ball and then you run on the bases. And as, as a lot of us who really dig in and watch it know that it is so much deeper than that. They're, they're not losing because the offense isn't producing runs. That is a factor. But when you have starting pitching, not going deep, giving up runs right away. And again, they're not doing it on purpose. It's just, it's happening. They can't find the zone. They're having an off day. They're tired, whatever the, the reason is. And then you also have the bullpen coming in overtaxed for me. And, and I know we're going to get into it when we talk about the home run derby, but like the offense is coming in at a deficit. In some cases, some of these games, they're already scoring so – the opposing team is scoring so quickly in the beginning of that game. That's daunting. Not only are we trying to defend the pitcher who's exhausted and all of these balls are either going into play, we're not getting a lot of strikeouts, but now I've got to get back up to the plate and try to at some point either swing for the fences because I'm feeling the pressure from the fans and from everybody else and the expectations of the entire league – or I play small ball and something happens and that doesn't work out. I hit it right to the player and, you know, oh, a, you know, grounder or double play. Like there's so many facets that could go wrong. And I think that's something that we who dig into the game more forget. It's not just hit the bat or hit the ball with the bat and then run the bases. There is so much more that goes into it. And that's also where so much more can go wrong, especially when you've got an exhausted starting rotation an exhausted bullpen, et cetera. And we're missing most of our infield. Uh, I mean, look, on Saturday, you scored nine runs. That should have been enough for you to win a game. Uh, it does feel like the offense is a little bit feast or famine. Uh, when you have Evan Phillips come in and he gets two strikes on hitters and he can't put them away, he's missing location. Usually when you're missing location, I think it's a sign of fatigue. And that to me is, is what's concerning. And I know we're going to get into it in the next episode when we review the first half and look he, into the second half. He didn't get but, set up well by Venasco either though. Like he came in with, you know, the game kind of starting to turn on its head and then it just kind of spiraled out of control. Yeah. And then that's one of those things where I, we're putting players in positions where there's a reason why Venasco was in the minor leagues. If Venasco was that great, he'd be up in the major leagues. So, but they again, have no, they literally have no arms. They claimed Honeywell off of waivers. I think he got the call or he flew in at midnight and then pitched the following day. Like, yeah. Dave Roberts even acknowledged, well. yeah, he, he acknowledged though. He's like, yeah, we're, we're, out of, we're out of options at this point. Like, we are literally doing everything we possibly, we claimed a guy off waivers. And he did a great job for those three innings that he came in. Well done, Brent Honeywell. <laughs> like, uh, happy your debut. Robert's words were desperation. That was a desperation mm -hmm. move. That's what it was, yes. To, to bring in a, a Honeywell. But like I said, I'm not going to get mad at the fact that, you know, Venasco gave up those runs because, again, 
this is the situation that you're in. Venasco shouldn't have been there. But because you have all these injuries and because it's you're not saving- like he was out there and I'm, I'm not coming at you, but it's not like Roberts was out there like hitting pitchers with a bat and like throwing them on the aisle himself. It's just the nature of the beast of what's going on in the league. Yeah. I mean, the problem is, is you had relievers that you were using. There were not just one, but a number of relievers that would have been four games in five days. And he specifically said he did not want to do that to Vessia. Vessia is having a great, great season. And you don't want to, you don't want to hurt him, right? You don't want to hurt him. You, you got to take health into mind. But look, if some of those guys can do their job, the Dodgers sweep the Tigers. Now, that doesn't say that it makes the road trip better, right? But going three and three on a road trip is just on par uh, to what the stretch the Dodgers are currently going through right now, which is they are a 500 team right now. They are a 500 team. And what we don't know and what the Roberts has said, and I think the, I think the whole organization, I don't think they know why this team is playing the way it's playing. You can say it's the injuries. You can point at the injuries. You can point at the underperformance of, 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 of players, the inconsistency. Um, you just hope that when it comes to the second half, they can find some sort of inconsistent uh, of, of some level of consistency, because if the consistency that they find is to continue to be inconsistent, I, I don't know if the timeline's going to make it, Amy. I, I really don't know if the timeline's going to make it to the end of the year. I mean, th but that's with anything. Like, stuff looks great on paper, and then uh, you're interviewing somebody for a job. They look absolutely great on paper. Or they, you come in, and they're either, like, maybe they're shy. Maybe they're a nightmare. Like, that's – you interject humanity into everything. Like, I know people scoff at my example, but, like, communism is a great concept. I'm not – saying that we should be a communist country settle down everybody but communism on paper is a great idea socialism on paper is a great idea you add in humanity and that never works pick up animal farm pick up you know anything like that you add in some kind of human nature and something's always going to add it like you can't create a formula for that you can't just make it that we have all these great players on paper and we're going to win the world series nobody to date has still been ever been able to do that you can't buy a team and that's where everybody who talks about checkbook baseball like that's great but how does that typically work out whether you're you know moneyball oakland a's who stumble on a formula but it doesn't work in the postseason or you're the dodgers or the yankees who buy you know great players but still don't really make it all the way to the end that's that literally is baseball because anything can happen yeah, and the Dodgers aren't the only ones going through it. I mean, the Yankees are six and sixteen in their last thirty-two. I mean, uh, twenty-two uh, games. So they've been going through a spell. The Guardians, who looked unbeatable at one point, their pitching, their starting pitching, has been getting beaten up lately. So yeah, you know, teams go through these stretches. I think one of the things that you brought up that is going to be very interesting to see in this second half is the expectations. If the weight of expectations is too much for them, if that's what's contributing to performance, you laugh because you don't think that's true, right? No, I'm laughing because I'm I'm just curious. Like, uh, just, it, it feels like people are not enjoying watching this game. The, and, and we already have so few baseball fans. Like, there are a lot out there, but obviously we're trying to grow the game. If for, like for me, I said this, this series didn't feel good, but I moved on to the next, like, Hey, we've got a new game. Hey, we've got the home run derby coming. We've got the all-star break. Now we've got the Boston series on the horizon. To me, it was like, all right, cool. They didn't perform the way that they wanted to, but move on. And it feels like, like you can dig into the data all you want. Everybody can experience this game however they want to. But if, if you watch, if anybody watching it, this is inhibiting your ability to experience joy watching this game. Why, why are you like, what can you change about it? Because the team is going to do the best that they can. It feels like the people who are watching this team are not having a good experience. So what can you do to change that? I know for me, this, like this slid off my back. It was like, all right, cool. We're on to the next game. 
it does not feel like that's the case for many other Dodgers fans. I know we talk about my circle versus your circle. My circle wasn't worried about this last week. My cir- We enjoyed each of the games. There weren't great points that happened, but, you know, especially like poor Johan uh, Ramirez made those two errors in the end. And it was like, oh, gosh, you had players right next to you. But he's in that he's in the moment. He's he's has a split second to make a decision. And he thinks he's doing the best thing in that moment. I, we when we were talking about it afterwards, we gave him some grace. And it was like, yeah, that sucked. Yeah, it lost the game. But at the same time, like he didn't set out to do that talked about it and then moved on to something else. So I just, I'm wondering how people want to experience this game. Is it enjoyable the way that, that a majority of fans are continuing to experience it that way? I, I, you know, I, I can't speak for them, but there is my, in my attempt to try to understand them, it's not enjoyable because it's to to watch your team lose. No, I'm not, I'm not throwing a party. (laughs) No, I, I know, but when you think about like players that play on like horrible teams, let's say, you know, somebody that plays on the Oakland, how many times have you heard the losing gets to them? They get miserable, they, they become miserable, or they end up having a post game interview where they throw a tirade, where they throw bats all over the place, and you're just like, hey, bro, it's just a game. But are they really just reacting to a game? Or it's just accumulation of everything that, you know, that's been going on. And the thing is, is I think it's a very healthy mindset that you have to turn the page and you move forward. I thought that's what page. baseball was about. <laughs> it's like, okay, we have a new game. Start over. <laughs> and and I feel like the people that are able to do that are the ones that are successful in this sport. Right. They're they able. But these are fans. There's a reason why, you know, the word fanatic was was created. There is no reason. There is no reason to to fans behavior because it's usually it's translated to passion. I, I, I say this. I don't know if you saw the Copa America final and the disaster that that ended up happening in Miami where you literally had fans who had no tickets bum rush into the stadium and people who had tickets, people who spent 1500 to $2,000 for a ticket, get into the stadium and someone else is sitting in their seat and they go to security and they go, Hey, someone's in my seat and security says to them, sorry, there's nothing I can do like that to me is insane. Like, how is this allowed to happen, right? But there's a group of people that are so passionate, that love this so much, that they're willing to go a game without a ticket and just have no scruples and say, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to watch it. That behavior to me has no, there's no, you could sit here and explain it to me, Amy, but I'll never understand it. Like, and that's kind of how I feel when Dodger fans are so passionate. They love the Dodgers so much. They want the Dodgers to be successful. And when the Dodgers are not, it's like something snaps in them. And and I'm trying to be sensitive to it. Right. But something like snaps in them. And, and it's just, they have to, they have to let it out because if they keep it inside, it's even more destructive. And and it's not like it is not an indictment on how people if you want to enjoy the game that way, like everybody gets their choice. But it t- from from my perspective, seeing all like the diatribes that people are putting out there, that doesn't feel like you're enjoying the game. And I understand, yes, it's a it's an outlet, but you're putting that outlet out there for everybody on social media to see. And to me, I'm a passionate fan. I I love my team. And again, just an it's just a different experience but for me it's like i i guess when you bring up like players i one doesn't that get to the players when they're seeing a lot of this negativity out on social media from you know the fans that are you know i love this team i support this team and then this is also the fan base that is like hanging me out to dry like that like it can't feel good on top of everything else like i just i don't know i <laughs> I don't, I don't want to make this into like me against somebody or us against them. Right. You can, you can experience the game, as I've said many times, however you want. I guess my question, because I don't understand it is if you're not enjoying it, what can you do to change that? Cause it just like that, 
it makes me sad for fans. Like it makes me sad to see you're you're really not enjoying the game that much. You clearly love it. And like this team, it feels like maybe in that moment and maybe once it passes, it's okay. But like these guys are trying. Like I guarantee you, Ramirez, not you, but <laughs> Johan, <laughs> didn't want to blow the end of that game. Like it just he I, he didn't. And you know what? I commend him that he took that interview after that game and answered all those questions. And I I don't know if you saw. Did you see the interview? I saw pieces of it. Yeah, because I don't think they put the whole thing up. But I know that he was upset, but his body language did not come off as defeated. And he was like, everything that you were talking about, he's like, I'm turning the page. I'm going to the next day, right? And I commend him for having that because it could have been very easy for him to be like, no, I'm not going to answer any questions. And we've seen it many times before where players don't want to go ahead and, and, mm -hmm. and talk to the media. But like what you were describing earlier with fans and them not enjoying it, I don't know if you remember what Chris Taylor looked like at the beginning of the year. Like oh, that oh, man, I, re I remember. <laughs> did he not look defeated? Did he not look like he was not having fun? Like when he's making comments, like, I don't think I ever, I didn't think I was ever going to hit another home run again. Like that is like the sadness that you are describing with fans. Now, one of the things that I commend Chris Taylor for is he still showed up to the stadium every day. He still went in and he did all the work and as painful as this whole experience must be for him this season he's still going up there and he's still showing up and I, again it's me trying to understand the fans and the sense if you're this miserable then just don't watch but i do believe that they keep watching because they are somewhat optimistic that it's going to turn around it's it, it's going to get better but I, I, I get it. I finally took your point, and I I now on my Twitter feed, I only look at the for uh, <laughs> the people that I'm following. I no longer look at the for you. So, and I and I was much better. So let's let's end the show with positives, okay? Because at the time we are recording this, the home run derby just ended, and I know Amy, you love the home run derby, so I'm gonna turn it over to you. Oh my gosh. And we missed out on the sweaty jerseys from this last week. We'll cover that in when we talk about the next episode, because good grief, those jerseys this last week. Holy cow. Um, I don't, I, did you get to watch the home run derby? I did. Uh, my, my daughter and I were watching the home run derby. Both my daughter and I thought he wasn't going to make it into the second round. I may oh have been my, taking notes. You kept score it. Did, did you keep score? I Can you keep scoring a home run derby? Oh, oh yeah, scoring. I had I had the like when they took their break, how many pitches they had left, how many they got before the break, after the break, and then in the bonus round. And, and I and I didn't do that for the show. I did it because it makes my brain happy. So um, it was interesting because especially when you first go into it and you have Alec Bohm hits twenty one out the gate. So I'm curious. This is a, the question I asked my best friend. Would you want to go first and try to hit as many as you could, or do you want to go second, knowing what you have to go up against? I, I would like to go first. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to know. <laughs> yeah, because after at, the, at that point, there's nothing you can do. If the guy beats you, the guy beats you. But if mm -hmm. you go knowing, all right, I got to hit 22. I feel now, not only are you competing against that guy, but you're competing against yourself. I'm so, in my yeah, head now, like, oh, my God, I've only hit four. He's at 22. So challenge, yeah. put that question out to all of our listeners, too. Do you guys want to go first? Do you want to go second? And why? Throw that up in the comments. But um, I, I much like you, I was really hoping that the Oscar would advance. And um, I, I was just really happy that he made it through. And then when he made it to that semifinal round and him and Alec Bohm tied, and then they went into a swing off and you saw the Oscar get, he fouled and then he hit two home runs. Cause they only get three swings in a swing off. That's it. And then Alec Bohm got an out, hit a home run and got an out. And it was just like, Oh my God, he's going to the final round. And to have him be the first Dodger that has ever won the home run derby, like, just he is so deserving i was so happy for him and it, it just he won by like inches because bobby witt jr would have hit that tying home run and it it hit the wall and it was like with the new format i loved it i loved everything about this year's home run derby because i i hated the brackets 
we will talk about that another time because, oh, I hate those brackets. <laughs> uh, I thought when Bobby Witt hit that last one, I thought it was gone. I yeah. thought he had tied him. I, when it hit so the weird. wall and like, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. I, I, I thought it was gone. Look, look, I have to say this, Amy. I am not a home run derby fan, but I thought the swing off, I thought that was enjoyable. I know this is not going to be popular when I say this, <laughs> but I kind of would have liked to have seen Bobby Witt Jr. win because he's from that area. And I think that would have been a really nice moment for him being an all-star winning a home run derby, you know, near your hometown. Um, you're, so you're a better I, person than me. Cause I'm like, no Teoscar all the way. <laughs> uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I found it entertaining. And the other thing I, I want to give some flowers, of course, flowers to Teoscar for winning it, but I want to give flowers to glass now. Tyler Glasnow, who was there supporting him the he, whole... He might as well have been, like, mopping his brow. <laughs> yeah, he stayed the whole round. So I want to give flowers to Tyler Glasnow. But I also want to give flowers to Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Because of how what he did, I think, really speaks to the power of friendship. You know, he's not... They're not teammates any longer. But for him to... Uh, look, I, I, I know this may be shade, but whatever... But I kind of wish that Otani, Will Smith, and some of the other Dodger All Stars, and I don't know if they were still on the field when the Oscar was in the semifinals or in the finals. But I kind of, I kind of would have wished because there was a moment when Bobby Witt Jr. took a timeout, and all the Royals All Stars were surrounding him. And the same thing happened when Ramirez of the Guardians when he took a, a break. All the, the the Guardians teammates were around him. So it did make me scratch my head where I'm sitting there going, where, where's Otani? Where's where's Will Smith? Like, I, I saw Glass now there. So I don't know if they were on the field and just the camera didn't catch them. But I don't, I don't know. I mean, keep in mind, it was also this started at eight o'clock there. Freddie had his kids out on the field or at least at least Charlie. So he had the kiddos out there. So I'm wondering if as it got later, did some of the families just, you know, leave? They've also got to play and, a game and that, tomorrow. So and that I, might be the, the point. But to me, uh, that's why I just I feel like with Tyler Glasnow and let's be fair, Tyler Glasnow single doesn't have to worry about kids. He's also injured. He's probably not pitching. Yeah. Tomorrow. So but not in the I game. Felt what him and Vladdy Guerrero Jr. did for the Oscar, I, I felt was worry of worthy of Flores. A hundred percent. And and Vladdy had a custom jersey made uh, of the, the Blue Jays, but with the Oscar's uh, name and his number on the back. And he wore that the whole time. Like I just he's the one who gave him some pointers like halfway through that helped with his swing. Like, hey, make sure you're hitting into the bullpen. Like aim for that. Like that's the spot. And that's what changed it, I think. That was a turning point for Theoscar in in the competition, and I just the whole thing I think was really great. Um, I think the MLB gets a lot of flack for some of the changes that they make. I think this was one of the good ones. I think it made it more engaging, it made it more competitive, but it also freed up some of those. Like I just think the bracket sometimes made it unfair bringing those in more towards the semifinals. I think you gave everybody equal standing to earn their place in there and then and then make it competitive and i just um even watching the kids catch in the field vladimir like coming over supporting somebody it's just all the reasons that baseball is fun to me like these guys they may be opposing teams like on the field but they are still people who came up together who played on teams together this is what makes baseball fun this is what makes me smile this is why i love this sport and i think tonight's home run derby just encapsulated all of that. And there was even a commercial, I think part way through where, you know, you had a lot more of the diversity being shown and there was like an El Beso es otra cosa, like just some other, like, again, diversity growing the sport. And it just, it really made me smile seeing a lot of that happen tonight on the field. Yeah. I, I, like I said, I, I'm not a fan of the home run derby, but for the semifinal to the final, I felt was very, very exciting. And uh, congratulations once again to the Oscar Hernandez. Uh, I know uh, we went a little long on this episode, uh, <laughs> but uh, longer than we thought. So that's going to do it for this uh, episode. Amy, do you have any anything else you want to add? Um, no, we'll be dropping another episode tomorrow, though. So uh, probably after the All-Star Game. So just uh, stay stay tuned. We'll, we'll get something done and get something out for you guys. 
Absolutely. So this is where I'm going to remind everybody that if you've been listening to us on the audio portion, please make sure you're subscribed to the podcast. Rate us, write us a review, help spread the word. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed to our YouTube channel. Hit that notification button. Give us a thumbs up. Leave us comments. Let us know what you think. And most importantly, make sure you're following us on social media, on X at BB Shangri-La, on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitch at Baseball Shangri-La. She is Amy Cuevas. I am Juan Ramirez. Nos despedimos con un beso. Amy, say goodbye to the people. Goodbye, people.